Welcome, Earth Science Kids. Today we're going to be studying Earth's history. Look at that picture. Can you imagine? Yeah, that was our home. The Earth we see today is the result of huge lengths of time gently passing, just as we see today, occasionally punctuated by catastrophic events far beyond anything we have ever known. The combination of vast amounts of peaceful time and occasional devastating events. That's what makes the Earth. That's what makes everything you've ever seen. To study it, we're going to have to talk about something called deep time. It's the deep past, well, the Earth is known to be 4.6 billion years old. Now, during this time, Earth has undergone many, many changes. Where would you find evidence of those changes? Only in the rock. Only the rocks would preserve these changes. That's why we study the rocks. Now, rocks are fascinating all by themselves, but the information they can tell us about what has happened here, that's worth everything. You look at rock here, you see these tilted sedimentary beds, and then they're truncated, they're, they're cut off at the top. How could that happen? Vast amounts of time. So how we know the past? Geologists can determine many of the past events occurring on Earth using the principle of uniformitarianism. Now, what does that mean? It simply means the present is the key to the past. The events we see today have been happening for most of Earth's history. The uniform, the day-to-day -day constant events, the Earth you've seen all your life, those processes, if you allow them to occur over billions of years, would, for the most part, make the Earth we see today. Uniformitarianism. So the law of superposition, the first simplest law of this. Rock layers are oldest on the bottom and youngest on the top. Igneous rocks that might flow on the surface. Well, wherever the igneous rocks flow or cut through or anything, the igneous rocks must be the last thing to occur there. In other words, they had to have flown over or through rock that was already existing. So intrusions must be younger than the rock they're intruded into. So what's the order of events here? Youngest to oldest. You can see it. A was laid down first, then B, C, and D on top of it. That makes a lot of sense. Folds and faults. Folds are bends in rock strata. Folds might overturn a rock layer, might even make younger rock on the bottom. Geologists always have to prove that the rock was not folded. You don't have to worry about it. Faults are cracks in rock strata along which movement has occurred. Faults cause offset layers. But all of these things have to be younger than the strata that they have changed. These are the different kinds of faults you can have, normal or reverse fault, thrust fault, strike slip fault, and they all will leave evidence in the rock. So very quickly, the law of cross-cutting relationships, an igneous intrusion is younger than the rock that it goes through. Contact metamorphism will occur on all sides of an igneous intrusion, but not on top of an igneous intrusion if it reaches the surface. So if you have a lava flow on the surface, well, the top of it's in contact with the air, so you're not going to burn anything there. Folds, point, folds, sorry, faults, folds, and joints are younger than the rocks they occur in. Rock fragments must be older than the rock they make up. Okay, now, now what's the order of events? We still have A, B, C, and D, but you also see then an igneous intrusion and a fault. Well, we could go backwards. What was the very last thing to occur here? Well, how about the fault? Did that go through everything? Sure. What was the next to last thing? All right, now that's going to be a little harder. Look at the igneous intrusion. It burned through A, B, and C. So the igneous intrusion had to have come after A, B, and C. Was D there when the igneous intrusion occurred? There's really no way to tell. A, B, and C, probably D, then the igneous intrusion, and then the fault. 
would be the order of events that is most likely. Cross-cutting relationships. Okay, here we have all sorts of um, intrusions cutting through rock, and the rock had to have been there first. When we do a geologic profile, we gain great insight to what a place, what the adventures a place has been over time and over vast time. This is actually a cross section of the Grand Canyon. Fossil is any naturally preserved remains or impression of a living thing. Fossils in general are only found in sedimentary rock. And in general, fossils are the hard parts of creatures, the bones, the teeth, the shells. Some limestone beds are made entirely of fossil remains. That is a crinoid. Uh, the top part, the part that looks like a flower, is actually a jellyfish-like creature, sort of an inverted jellyfish related to coral and jellyfish. And it sends its tentacles up to catch uh, little creatures living in the water. And it's on these long stems that are called crinoid stems. Well, that tells us stuff, doesn't it? Little dinosaur emerging. This was a very popular fossil back in the day, long time ago. These are trilobites and occurred all over planet Earth. And we got to see their evolution over time in the rock of planet Earth. Sometimes the hard parts of a fossil have completely been replaced by minerals. So the fossils would be said to have been petrified. A mold would be an impression in the mud and a cast would be material that has filled it in. So the cast looks like the original creature. The mold looks like an outline of the original creature. And a fossil would provide evidence of past environments. For example, coral, well, coral only happens in warm water. So if you find coral, like you could find in New York State, it means New York State at the time had to be in a much warmer environment. Geologists love index fossils. Why? Well, an index fossil is a fossil of an organism that lived for a very short time, but it was everywhere. What that means, because it lived for a short time, if you find it, now you would memorize, if you're a geologist, a paleontologist, you would memorize a whole lot of index fossils. And when you find one, that means you have now identified how old, within a certain range, you've identified how old this bed is that you found the fossil in. That means now you know the ages above it and below it. So like layers of paper, sediments are deposited on top of one another. But unlike paper, the only place you could find these layers exposed is at outcrops. Geologists must relate the layers to other outcrops in the area. So here's a neat example. Look at this. Uh, these would be three outcrops. Okay, these are three outcrops. And we have to correlate them. So how does uh, this outcrop but how does this outcrop correlate with this outcrop? All right, well, we start looking at fossils. We don't find these fossils down in this outcrop here, but we do find these fossils, which are index fossils, and we find the same rock type here as the rock type here. So we can correlate these beds right here. Meaning, if I wanna know what's below the beds here, these are below the beds here. All right, similarly, um, I'm correlating the bottom of this layer to the top of this layer using these index fossils that are similar in both of these. So what's below this bed here? Well, these beds here. So over time, we would put together an entire geologic cross-section of an area just by looking at outcrops and being very smart. Do we need to drill down to sample everything? No, we don't. Drilling is very, very expensive. It doesn't always get you the information you want. Um, but geologists, being smart, don't generally need to do things like that. So we use rock similarities and index fossils to correlate. 
The sedimentary rock layer may extend for hundreds of miles. Geologists try to identify the layers at outcrops. Same layer may appear in many different outcrops. Layers of rock at the Grand Canyon. It's almost impossible to stand at the Grand Canyon and not try to follow layers around the canyon. And notice that layers on one side correlate with layers on the other. And again, there's that geologic cross-section of the Grand Canyon. So it's difficult to determine the relationship of layers separated by large distances. Matching of layers is done by matching the sequence of the layers, and we use index fossils to identify the relative age of a bed. So again, the sequence of the layers, the rock type, and index fossils give us a good indication of how the layers are related to each other. An unconformity is a buried erosional surface. An unconformity represents missing rock layers. An unconformity therefore means a gap in geologic time. To form an unconformity, well, deposition only occurs underwater. So if you have uplift, the rock layers are now up above the sea level, which means you're gonna erode them. And as you erode them over millions of years, you remove whole rock layers. And then you submerge that below the water again and start depositing new rock on it. And you have a gap where the new rock being deposited is on top of rock that is much, much older than it. And there was not a continuous deposition of rock. So if you look at how we would form an angular unconformity, nice, peaceful rock under the ocean having deposits regularly upon it. These deposits are all related one after the other. Then through some geologic forces, the rock is all tilted, uplifted, and then it is eroded. So here you have this weird erosional surface on it. Then you deposit, or, or then you put it under the water again and deposit more layers on it. And you have, look at this, a beautiful angular unconformity. You could tell that there is some huge missing time there. And this is the famous angular unconformity at Sicker Point that got James Hutton to start thinking that, hey, the Earth must be far older than the 6,000 years that were being advertised. It's a beautiful rock layer, right? You don't have to be a geologist to notice that this is totally different than this, that whatever happened on the lower rock layer here had to have been separated in vast amounts of time from the upper rock layer. And both of them must have taken enormous amounts of time to occur. We see unconformities all over the place. So index fossils, would humans be good index fossils? Well, we're found all over the planet. If we exist for a few more million more years so that our time here is geologically short, 20 million years is considered geologically short. Then at that point, if we're gone, any beds that have evidence of humans will be known to be of the human age. Even without index fossils, we can identify strata in time. If you look at a, a variety of different fossils and compare their known existences to each other, the rock being laid down could only have occurred where all of their time spans actually overlapped. Geologists love volcanoes because they spread a huge amount of ash over a vast area in a short time. It's just like an index fossil. So if the ash bed is found in widely separated outcrops, we know the ages of the rock relative to that ash fall. Right? Some volcanoes release huge amounts of volcanic ash, which covers vast areas in a very short time. That's what an ash deposit would look like, at least a relatively fresh one. Geologists of the 18th and 19th century noted, noticed that certain rock formations could be identified by the type of fossils they contained. And certain formations with those fossils were always, and I mean absolutely always, above or 
below other formations. If it was above another formation, it was always above it. If it was below it, it was always below it, without exception. And that had to mean something, and it started them thinking. They established a sequence of fossil groups from the oldest to the youngest. And again, there were zero exceptions to this. Previously, it was thought that all fossils were made at the same time as a special creation, just like all creatures were made at the same time as a special creation. But as we began to understand that we evolved over vast amounts of time, we also began to see that fossils fit into that. So each group of fossils was named for a location where its major fossil could be found. So if we found fossils in Devon, England, they would be called Devonian. So those bizarre names, they're just place names. Cambria, England, that's where Cambrian fossils come from. Mississippian, yeah, Pennsylvanian. So if you know some of the place names, you could kind of figure out it's all place names. Relative time is just indicating which fossils came first. So we worked out a geologic timetable. We divided it into eras, periods, and epochs. Each is a way of dividing up the one before. So if you look in your Earth Science reference tables, you could see what I'm talking about. This is the main timeline right here. Uh, you can see uh, beginning of the Earth at the bottom, right now at the top, and you can see that most of this is divided into something called the Precambrian. Okay, the Precambrian lasted all this time here, and then the more recent times are all up in here, because the more recent times are more recent, more interesting, and sexual reproduction had started tremendous evolution variability within creatures. We have to expand this table into all of this so we could really put down the details. Geologists knew that the oldest rocks contained no fossils. The first life that caused major fossils to be formed was in the Cambrian period. That's why they call everything before it the Precambrian. Really very few fossils at all. But in the Cambrian period and all the periods after it, the rocks were full of fossils. We have found some Precambrian fossils that are over 3 billion years old. These are our algae that built coral reefs. So a lot of life existed in the Precambrian, but without hard parts to fossilize, we don't have much evidence of it. Precambrian rock is all, also likely to have been destroyed or metamorphosed. There are some stromatolites, deep, deep ancestors, fossil cyanobacteria. They started making the oxygen in the atmosphere. A study of the fossil record shows that life has become more complex. Within each species are variations of size, shape, and other traits. The theory of evolution states that organisms that have traits that help them survive do better and pass those traits on to their offspring. When you look at rock and you look at rock beds, one on top of another, and you find creatures in them down below, and then you find similar creatures up above, you can see the process of evolution right in front of you. And there's the history of life going back and back and back. So we see time that makes sense to us. We have fossils of till right about here, and then very few fossils. We do have some fossils, and we know what we're talking about, but not many fossils. There weren't hard parts. And before that, time is truly hard to imagine. So the fossil record shows much evidence for the process of evolution. Most species that have ever lived have become extinct. Other species that were better adapted outcompeted them for resources. Still going on today. Many species left no fossil evidence at all. Fossils are really hard to make, so you do not find them all the time, but we have found enough in, in vast quantities really uh, that it's, it's possible to reconstruct most of what has happened here. Humans, well, we've only recently evolved from ape-like creatures over the past four million years or so. 
that's a tiny percentage of the Earth's um, existence. So we are brand new. And these would be um, the two forms of modern humans that existed uh, up until a very short time ago. Uh, the one on top are Neanderthals. Uh, they have died out somewhere around 10,000 years ago. And it may be that modern humans help them die out. We are uh, known for being a little on the aggressive side. So one last thing on understanding uh, geologic history is how we find absolute ages of things. And that is through radioactive dating. So radioactive dating uses the natural radioactivity of some substances to determine the absolute age in years of fossils or rock strata. Many atoms have more neutrons than normal. These are isotopes, and this sometimes causes them to be radioactive. That is, over time, they break apart into smaller atoms. A radioactive isotope will break down naturally into a lighter element called a decay product. So in this case, carbon-14, which is not the normal carbon, carbon-14 has eight neutrons instead of the typical six. Carbon-14 will break down into nitrogen 14. You don't need to understand the process, though the process is well understood. So carbon-14 breaks down into nitrogen-14, which is called the decay product. Now, the half-life is the time required for half of the atoms of a particular radioactive sample to change into the decay product. After one half-life, there are equal amounts of the radioactive element and its decay product. Every radioactive substance has a specific half-life. A short half-life is good for recent organic remains. A long half-life is good for older rocks. The age of the rock can be inferred upon based upon the ratio of the decayed to undecayed substance. At the end of one half-life, half the radioactive substance will remain. After two half-lives, one quarter of it will remain. Now, how could that be? If half of it disappears in the first half-life, many would expect the other half to disappear in the second half-life. However, an atom, a radioactive atom does not have a wristwatch. It doesn't know how much time has elapsed. All that we have is a group of radioactive elements or radioactive atoms. And what we understand is that if you have a group of those radioactive elements, half of them will break down in the time we call the half-life. Once you have that remaining group of radioactive elements, they don't know they've been around for a long time. Half of them will break down in the next half-life and so on and so forth. So you keep cutting the amount of material left in half. So after two half-lives, a quarter of the material is left. Three half-lives, an eighth of the material is left. So carbon-14 could be used to date fossils since all organisms are made from carbon, but it has a very short half-life and it's not useful for dating really old fossils. So that's the idea. Radioactive material at time zero. After one half-life, half of it remains. Two half-lives, a quarter of it remains. Three half-lives one-eighth of it will remain, and so on. In the next half-life, half the remaining, right? So we just keep going with this. The decay product ratio, just the ratio. If the, radio, the ratio of radioactive element to the decay product is 50%, one half-life has occurred, 25%. Two half-lives, 12.5, three half-lives. 6.25, four half-lives. 3.125, five half-lives have occurred. So we can then just, if five half-lives have occurred, five times the actual amount of time for a half-life would give you how old the sample is. For carbon-14, the half-life is 5,700 years. Two half-lives would be twice that, or 11,400 years. The half-life of commonly used radioisotopes are in your reference tables. 
The beauty of radioactive decay is this is stuff in the nucleus. So it's unaffected in any way. There's nothing you can do, not with pressure, temperature, chemical action. You can smack it with a hammer. It doesn't matter. You will never affect its half-life. So there's several radioactive elements that a geologist may use for dating. Sample has to contain some radioactive material. So once living things contain carbon-14, if it's older than 50,000 years, though, there's probably not enough carbon-14 to really do any useful dating on it. So outside of about 10 half-lives, you really cannot use this. But fortunately, if you look here, carbon-14, 5,700 years, but then we have a lot of other elements. Look at potassium-40. 1.3 times 10 to the ninth years. That's 1.3 billion years. Uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years, which means half the uranium that uh, the Earth was formed with has decayed already in the life of the Earth. So good versus bad dating. Uranium-238 has a half-life of 4.5 billion years, the age of the solar system. In recent rocks, too little of this will have decayed to get a good age of a sample. Therefore, there are samples which will not be suitable for radioactive dating. All right, so a rock contains 50 grams of potassium-40 and 50 grams of its decay product, argon-40. How old is the rock? Well, since all the decay product was originally the radioactive isotope, the rock contained originally 100 grams of potassium-40, and now it has 50 grams of the radioisotope and 50 grams of the daughter product. Thus, one half-life has occurred, and we find the half-life of potassium to be 1.3 billion years. So the rock is about 1.3 billion years old. Hey, here's a good sample problem. So. The planet Krypton exploded 2,000 years ago, forming kryptonite, which would just be fragments of that planet. The infamous and evil criminal Lex Luthor knows that only kryptonite can destroy Superman, but he also knows that it takes at least 10 grams of radioactive kryptonite to do it. Well, assuming that all the kryptonite produced when the planet exploded was radioactive, and knowing the half-life is 500 years, if Lex Luthor had 80 grams, could he destroy Superman? All right, so let's think this through. The half-life, 500 years. How much does Lex Luthor have? 80 grams. Huh. And it's 2,000 years ago that the planet exploded. So if he has 80 grams, well, after one half-life, what does he have? Excellent, 40 grams. That's 500 years. After two half-lives, how much does he have? Well, take that 40 grams and cut that in half. That's 20 grams. So now that's two half-lives, or a thousand years has passed. After three half-lives, or 1,500 years, all right, that 20 grams now gets cut in half to 10 grams. Uh-oh. And then you have one more half-life, bringing us to 2,000 years. That 10-gram sample gets cut in half again. So he only has five grams of radioactive kryptonite. Not enough to destroy Superman Long live Superman. <laughs> Thanks for watching.